Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Uh, well, not exactly. Uh, in fact, not at all. Today, it's U.S. foreign policy and international relations talk. And the talk in the United States and throughout the world since November 28th has focused on the release of some of the 250,000 U.S. diplomatic cables by WikiLeaks.org to major newspapers in the United States and Europe. The reaction? Shocking. Global diplomatic catastrophe, a new Pentagon Papers, a new world disorder, or overblown and actually helping the United States. While it's too early to determine the breadth and depth of the WikiLeaks release, it's never too soon to talk with Richard Murphy. Richard Murphy is the former ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Syria, the Philippines, and Mauritania. He has served as U.S. Secretary of State for Near Eastern and Asian Affairs, named career ambassador, and has served as senior fellow for the Middle East at the Council on Foreign Relations. Ambassador Murphy is a frequent TV commentator and widely consulted expert. Welcome back. Always a pleasure, always a learning experience. Let's start with Julian Assange. What's he all about? How do you read him? I think he believes that by exposing everything, you will somehow bring truth to the people of the world of what the American role has been and you will compel the American government to, uh, what's the term, compartmentalize its reporting and the sharing of its intelligence so it becomes less efficient and somehow weakens it as a global power. Okay, let me, let me read stuff from WikiLeaks itself and you respond to yeah. it. The, the heading is, why the media and particularly WikiLeaks is important. Quote, Publishing improves transparency, and this transparency creates a better society for all people. Better scrutiny leads to reduced corruption and stronger democracies in all societies' institutions. Your response? I think there's a limit to the transparency you can have in diplomacy, as there is in preparing for a business merger or for a divorce action, uh, all of these things require a degree of understanding that there's a need to keep your mouth shut uh, in the process of working out uh, a new arrangement. I mean, is it, is it at all conceivable to have sort of the open diplomacy that he's interested in or seeks to produce? I mean, it's Wilson, open covenants openly arrived at? It works? It doesn't work or hasn't worked uh, over the centuries that uh, uh, leaders have been trying to communicate with each other and countries to relate to each other. There's always been an assumption that there has to be some confidentiality, some respect for privacy as you work for open agreements. And the usual way has been let's have them secretly arrived at. Um, and that's... It, it, it's very hard to come down, certainly, on how much secrecy there mm -hmm. should be. There may be some benefit. We can talk about what WikiLeaks has done. Mm -hmm. But uh, the basic uh, challenge, I think, is frankly foolish that you can destroy confidentiality and somehow benefit the public. Okay. So what have we got here? What are these documents, some of the... 251,000 State Department cables in this. I guess this is the second major release of wiki documents after the, uh, the Iraq and Afghanistan mm -hmm. documents. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's a release of a quarter of a million documents from confidential uh, to secret. It apparently doesn't include top secret, doesn't include what we call code word or particularly sensitive documents re relating to nuclear issues. At least we don't think they have. We don't think they have them, but, uh, you know, time will tell on that. They, okay. they may surprise. 
So you read them, what's been released. What's been what released? was your reaction, both as a professional diplomat and now sort of as an outside analyst and observer? What, do you, what did you feel? Well, I didn't feel much surprise, frankly, because, uh, look, we've got a, the benefit and the curse of an uh, able and aggressive uh, press and a very close relationship between diplomats and the press uh, overseas in particular, where they have access to certain individuals that we can't officially be in touch with and they have insights. And there's a back and forth with a general understanding that uh, keep my name out of this, uh, but what, what can you tell me? How can you enlighten me on this? So this, there is a sh sharing, and I think if you had tracked issues such as uh, Syria, Saudi Arabian attitudes uh, towards given issues in the Times and other journals, uh, you wouldn't have been surprised by what you read in the cables. Yeah, that was part of the one of the responses. For example, Pina Beinert in uh, the Daily Beast says, why the WikiLeaks uh, drama is overblown. And he makes the same argument you do. There are basically eight or nine bullet points, Pakistan, China, uh, Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia. But anybody who read basically the Times and you know, a couple of blogs knew this before. So what, what is the value added of these pieces? Well, I don't see it because you, I mean, I, I don't see the great value added. Uh, uh, I'm not defending secrecy for secrecy's sake, but I just say it is the way the world <laughs> functions and you, you have to respect the other party's desire for private conversations and expect them to respect, uh, you know, the confidentiality of something you're saying, maybe testing out an idea. Mm -hmm. And you're not seeing something like the Pentagon Papers were. Talk to that. Okay, the Pentagon Papers were a uh, dissection of the uh, planning at the top levels of the American government uh, to carry on the Vietnamese war. These are not that. These are the documents from the field as the embassies uh, relate to their contacts, uh, discuss issues under instructions or uh, from Washington or exploring with the uh, uh, other officials of other governments issues that are on their minds. Uh, it doesn't represent the critical decision point when a policymaker such as the Secretary of State, the President, will say, all right, we're going this way or we're going that way. Basically, it seems to me that it's basic raw almost information, and this raw information doesn't necessarily get into the discussions of decision makers, let alone the decisions themselves. What's, you've been there. What, is, what, are, what are we talking about here? Describe what you would do as ambassador in Saudi Arabia or Syria or the Philippines in terms of communication. All right. Uh, this goes back a while. Uh, back to the, well, it's 30 years now, to uh, Syria. This was 1976 when uh, Syria had been asked to help the Lebanese uh, in their struggles with the Palestinians, with the, the then PLO militias. Mm -hmm. And the question was, could Syria send its troops across the border into Lebanon? And they were very cautious about this. Uh, they did not want to do anything that would get them caught up in a war with Israel. Mm -hmm. And there's always been high level of suspicion on both sides in Damascus and uh, Jerusalem about the other's intentions. So we were, if you will, the middleman uh, explaining the red lines that uh, you should not cross mm -hmm. if you send your troops into Syria. Now, there's been a reference to the red lines in various historical reviews of that uh, period, but it was kept very quiet at the time because uh, uh, it just wasn't considered useful uh, by Israel, by the Lebanese, the Syrians, or ourselves. So it looks like what you just described and the cables at least that I've been able to look at and, and, and through secondary sources, this looks like what's been going on with diplomats since, you know, wax seals. This is, you know, several centuries long, no? Oh, yeah. Sort of time immemorial. 
looking at the cables themselves, I mean, they. The one one commentator, I guess Leslie Gelb, argued that it's actually good for U.S. foreign policy. It's been good for the United States in so far as that it shows that our diplomats are honest, candid, and even funny. I mean, there's some really interesting stuff. I mean, one picture is that you folks, the professional diplomats, are really smart, really hardworking, and some of them are novelists. <laughs> well, novelists, not in the sense of creating fiction. Fiction, no. no, no. But in terms of the artistry Expressing of the work, the, the, the ambassador to Russia burns his, some of his descriptions of the autocrats in the, the various stands. Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, uh, they don't go out of their way at the State Department to hire stupid people or illiterate people. So, <laughs> I'm, and they, I'm sorry if I implied that. <laughs> but uh, no, they they write, and again, an influence of journalism. You've got to catch your audience's attention up front, and uh, in order to get your message across. So, it helps to have a sense of humor or a little. But descriptions twist of gold-plated handguns in the back pockets of you know, Central Asian dictators was just priceless. Talk about the charge that uh, diplomats are becoming spies, that this, this Clinton memorandum suggested that diplomats do things that diplomats haven't done, shouldn't do. Talk. Well, diplomats uh, around the world are often considered spies. They're, I mean, they're government officials openly sent uh, uh, to uh, other countries to uh, be the instrument of explaining our policies and getting reactions uh, back to uh, Washington to explain theirs and see, try to see where there's, for instance, uh, generally speaking, common ground that can be built upon and expanded. Uh, the, the latest that they were supposed to be, what, picking up credit card numbers and frequent flyer numbers is something that really does belong to the CIA. It's not That's a tacky. state. It's well. Come on. It's, it's useful. I mean, I can imagine it's useful in the uh, in the right hands at some point in time. But uh, it's not something uh, that a diplomat would expect. I mean, uh, you're just you're to peeking be over to check their credit card numbers. I mean, yeah, how I'm, would you have reacted to a memo I'm, like I'm that? I'm a little too nearsighted to get away with that. You know, you'd be really right <laughs> down there. Okay, so I mean, okay, the physical handicaps, yeah. you know, help. <laughs> you, in an earlier conversation, said that the, 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 these uh, cables and their release validated the belief that Americans can't keep their mouths shut. What is that? What did you mean by that? Well, we're pretty well known for being blabbermouths and... Uh, blabbermouths in what sense? Uh, well, that we can't uh, keep a confidence that if, uh, you know, while uh, when I was in the State Department, it was kind of a maxim, don't put down something in on paper that you don't want to see one day in the New York Times. Well, uh, that <laughs> horror has come to pass now, and there's a great pile of stuff that was not designed for publication, although we always knew there's a automatic release of the vast bulk of right. confidential uh, reporting. I think it's uh, starting 10 years, then 20 years, 30 years mm -hmm. after, depending on how sensitive it's judged to be. But many of these 250,000 documents, at least according to WikiLeaks themselves, are unclassified documents anyway that would have been eligible for release. What 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 specifically in the documents that you looked at or reported on that you can begin to make a judgment on their potential impacts? What's your assessment overall of the impact on U.S. foreign policy and international relations? I think uh, it probably in some cases, hopefully few, very few, puts the individual who made... Uh, indiscreet uh, comments to us about the policies of his government or their attitudes and I'm uh, towards uh, third governments and I'm thinking in this case of a message relating to a conversation not in China but involving a Chinese representative discussing North Korea. Well, was that licensed by Beijing that he speak to the Americans that way or did it just just happen? It was a very unusual uh, suggestion that uh, I think it was that China would look uh, 
uh, uh, would find acceptable a unification of the Koreas with South Korea in charge. Uh, if that wasn't licensed, that man is going to be out of a job and maybe uh, locked up as we speak. Sure. So, I mean, there are there at least those dangers on the other side of the discussion. There, there, is, there is that uh, that danger. Now, it's easy perhaps to exaggerate it, and I think uh, the uh, it was uh, Secretary Gates, Secretary of Defense, who said that he thought the uh, impact on diplomacy was going to be fairly modest, and I'm, I'm closer to that. It's going to make certain relationships that have been created between individual diplomats and their host government difficult. And that, I would presume then that means that there's got to be movement of diplomats around. Well, diplomats move around. They're generally, it's a three-year right. tour of almost all the But this would accelerate it, no? It, it could. It could, yeah. I mean, if, if the host government just says, I am not going to talk to you again uh, as an ambassador, you can't you can't serve in that. Now, uh, Secretary of State Clinton is out of the country. She's 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 going to the Gulf, I believe, she's at some there. point. Yeah. She's been there. Yeah. How much of American foreign policy, particularly in that region, is now deflected by this attention on, you know, smoothing over, you know, rough spots that have been caused by the leaks? I mean, it's got to have slowed down, for example, the Arab-Palestinian discussions, no? Well, it doesn't help, and I think it's, frankly, it's been misinterpreted. Uh, uh, some of these leaks have been misinterpreted in Israel, uh, uh, for instance, saying that this proves that the Arabs care only for the danger that Iran constitutes. They don't really get that worked up over Palestinian issues. And, in, and at least from the cables that have been released, which is a small number, that seems to be the case. That seems to be the case if an ambassador is talking with a certain set of foreign leaders. That does not reflect the concerns that the public polling okay. done with uh, seven or eight different Arab countries shows that mm -hmm. there's still a very uh, strong and passionate conviction on the part of the Arab publics that the Palestinian issue is key to regional security and stability. Let's move to the region more specifically. Let's start with Saudi Arabia. In many ways, some of the most interesting uh, revelations have been around Saudi Arabia, particularly King, King Abdullah saying to uh, American policymakers, cut off the head of the snake, meaning Iran. Talk about the Saudis' role in this, and, and talk about the nature of the emerging politics in the region. That particular quote, as I recall it, was made uh, by his ambassador in Washington. Okay. Uh, was, it, was it a literal quote, or was it an interpretation? I don't know. Uh, no one in Washington is surprised by the uh, doubts that the King of Saudi Arabia has about uh, Iran's leadership and the doubts he's had about uh, the uh, political leadership in Iraq. Uh, he's, he's been uncomfortable about it and he's refused to see, even to receive, the Prime Minister well, of he Iraq. Sh he should be uncomfortable. I mean, clearly, I mean, we've talked about this many times, the Shia-Sunni split and Iraq now controlled by Shias and Iran controlled by Shias, these Sunni Gulf states, they're in trouble, possibly. Well, the, the, the dice uh, has been rolled in a different way than they're used to, and uh, Iraq was under Sunni control for centuries, and suddenly uh, the invasion happens, uh, Saddam is gone, and the Americans come in and say, all right, it's one man, one vote. There are more Shia than there are Sunni, so there is a Sunni gov uh, Shia government today. And this has, this has been hard to digest in uh, parts of the Arab world, no question. Does it mean Iran is suddenly in charge of Iraq? No, they're fencing, they're maneuvering to try to play their role, and they'd like to be number one foreign influence on Iraq. Uh, there is Iraqi nationalism that they have to contend with, uh, as well as uh, uh, other outsiders hoping to play their role in Iraq. One of the, the, the things that struck me is that the, the, the Gulf states were particularly willing to have the United States take out the Iranian nuclear facilities, in a sense, while they, they held our coats. That said, they don't want to see, in my reading, is they don't want to see a war 
which could blow back on them. Their, given their relationship with the states, they would be, they are concerned about being caught up, swept up into the uh, chaos uh, that a war could create in the region. So, yeah, stop them, but you know, don't do it in a way that's going to hurt us. Is the, is the message? Okay. So, but at the same time, these leaks suggest that the Saudis are either governmentally or through private movements of money funding terror networks. So, I mean, the Saudis present a an interesting dilemma for U.S. foreign policy, both in terms of we need them as an ally in the region, but at the same time, they're funding terror. Well, you've got to be careful when you say well, they are funding okay. terror. I, <clears throat> who is it? Uh, uh, there's no evidence, to my knowledge, that the Saudi government is funding okay. al-Qaeda, is funding any of these groups. They Directly. are themselves a okay. target okay. As, as a regime. They are a target of, uh, and have been, of Osama bin Laden uh, for the last uh, 15 years. Okay, uh, there are vast private fortunes in the country, and they have been slower than we would uh, have liked to well, control them. I uh, love your diplomatic uh, way of thinking. Your balanced approach to these things. Oh. Well, it's uh, always struck me as rather sensible. You got to <laughs> well, look. Well, diplomats can be sensible. You got to look at the at the situation. Can they control the flow of private funds? Can it be placed outside Saudi Arabia? The answer is it has been, and they are doing more to control it than they were a decade ago. But is it has it been licked as a problem? No. Also, the Saudi problem is not only direct financial aid, but their support for a real fundamentalist form of Islam through their mosques and other things. So it may not be direct funding of terror, but clearly it's creating a culture and an infrastructure that can allow it to exist. Well, that, I think that's a fair point. <clears throat> and uh, uh, they themselves have said, look, uh, they're they're clearing out some uh, the dead wood in their educational system. They're ref trying to reform, but it's going to take time. Okay, let's move a little bit. Let's move a little bit east, I guess, and talk to, about Syria. Syria, it seems, from both the, the cables and other news reports, seems to have this sort of breaking out of a period of constraint, containment, and beginning to flex some regional muscle in, certainly in Lebanon, but in the region itself? Well, you know, I, I first went to Syria back in 1960 to uh, Aleppo, and then went back as an ambassador in the, uh, our ambassador in the mid-70s. And the Syrians do feel constrained. They, they have long felt that they are the leading uh, the beating heart, as they like to say, of Arab nationalism. And the trouble is that a lot of the other Arabs say, uh, yeah, that's all very fine, but uh, uh, you're one country among, among many. Uh, historically, they were the center of the Islamic world in the uh, uh, first century of Islam, but that's, that's back in the uh, seventh and eighth centuries. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> power moved to Baghdad later, power moved around, and uh, Syria does feel that uh, it was badly hurt by the division of the Arab world by the British and the French uh, after the First World War, and that they continued to lose territory as, as late as the, uh, I think it was the French deal with the Turks to take a province of, uh, away from northern Syria during the Second War. So. Uh, they do feel that they're, they should be recognized as much more influential and much more a leader and representative of Arab opinion than they are. And they, and they seem to be increased, uh, increasing or, or reestablishing their control over Lebanese politics, particularly with their relation to Hezbollah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's been a constant ebb and flow, you might say. Uh, uh, they... Uh, they overstayed the, I was mentioning the entry of their military force in 1976. 
uh, they, they stayed too long and they became very uh, burdensome on the Lebanese political system. And when the assassination of the Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri took place, there was this outpouring of sentiment, get the Syrians out of our country. And it happened. They, they, they pulled the troops out. Um, today, the, uh, are they active in Lebanon? Yes. Uh, the ties of history, the ties of families, of business, of culture are very strong, and they are the immediate neighbor. So they feel, again, they have a role in Lebanon, and they, they hear Americans say, stay out of Lebanon, and they, they just smile. What, what are you talking about? Is it your backyard? It's our backyard. Two quick questions in the last minute. Any surprises for you in the leaked documents that you stood there and said, hmm? No surprises on the area that I've worked in over the years on the Middle Eastern uh, news. I mentioned the surprise that the Chinese mm -hmm. might be uh, amenable to some new arrangements in Korea, but uh, I don't track that issue all right. that closely. What could be forthcoming? Speculate. Next well, round of, the next batch of cables. Well, I, un unless they have access to issues covered by code word, top secret material, I expect more of the same. The daily business of an embassy, of diplomacy, uh, conducting our affairs, explaining our positions, under trying to understand theirs, and trying to move our position ahead. Okay. My thanks to Ambassador Richard Murphy who never fails to enlighten. Next week, my guest will be Michael Myers, president and executive director of the New York Civil Rights Coalition. Join us. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.